Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. Welcome back, pet parent. I'm so happy you are here. So today I want to talk about foods for our pets. And this is kind of something that after last week's episode, if you haven't listened to it, I highly recommend you go back and listen to it. But I, it was really weighing like heavy on me after I talked about carnivores, the carnivores in our house. Just because something is safe to feed doesn't mean that we should be feeding it. There is a distinction there, and there are going to be differences. Like, every animal is an individual, so we really have to feed the dog or the cat in front of us. And I know Kimberly Gautier from Keep the Tail Wagging has been saying that for years, and I absolutely, like, there is, hand. that's the best, <laughs> the best statement, hands down. Feed the animal in front of you. Because just because something is safe to feed doesn't necessarily mean you should be feeding it. And there are lots of different examples of this from, of course, commercially available pet foods, but also just fresh whole foods in your home. Because just because it is safe to feed doesn't mean that your dog or cat needs it. So let's talk a little bit more about that. There are certainly lots of fresh foods that are going to be safe to feed. And let's just talk about a handful of them. Like I, I'm by no means going to like run the gamut of all foods, but fats, like raw fats from animal protein, they're safe to feed as a, as a generality, right? But animals with pancreatitis, certainly we don't want to be feeding them too much fat and just in general overfeeding fat can cause um, gut upset and diarrhea in dogs so we we don't necessarily want to feed a ton of skin and fat to our animals it needs to be proportionate with the other fresh foods that we're feeding similarly with foods like avocado the flesh of the avocado is certainly safe to feed your dogs but how much do you actually want to feed because it is a very fatty food. Now those are very healthy fats, yes, but you don't want to overdo it. But let's talk about some other foods that we may not even think about, like should I, should I not? For example, fruits in general, sweet fruits like watermelon, cantaloupe, strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, the sweet fruits that we think of yeah, they're totally fine to feed to our dogs. And you know what? In moderation, here and there as snacks and treats, sure, wonderful. But if we're feeding a whole heck of a lot of it, or even just a little bit too much, they have a lot of natural sugars in them. We don't want to overfeed sugars in general. So even if it is a natural sugar, we don't want to overdo it. In fact, I wouldn't, if my dog even ate fruit, which she doesn't. She doesn't like it. She's She is very much a meat eater. If I give her anything that's not meat, she spits it out, I promise you. But if I were to try to feed her fruit every day of the week, that might be a little bit too much for her. Even if it's just a teeny little bit, that's still a lot of natural sugar for her body to digest. You, she might start gaining weight. She might have some inflammation going on in the body just because there's too much sugar being introduced. And even if we think of something as simple as the incredible edible egg, right? These are wonderful, wonderful, wonderful foods and they are great sources of protein and lots of other vitamins. But when we feed too much egg or specifically we feed too much egg white, that can cause uh, what's known as biotin blockers in the body creating nutritional deficiencies because there can be an imbalance if your pet is getting too much egg white. 
And then we can get really into the nitty gritty of like, there are lots of different protein sources out there. There are lots of different animals in the world to provide to your pet to eat. Chicken, beef, turkey, pork, um, quail. In people in Australia, they feed a lot of kangaroo. There's, you know, buffalo. There's there's lamb. There, I mean, there there's all sorts of pro duck, right? There's lots of different protein sources, and we can kind of get into the nitty gritty of you know heating foods and cooling foods and uh, neutral foods when we talk about traditional Chinese veterinary medicine and how your dog's body responds best to different foods. I don't want to get too much into the nitty gritty of that, but again, thinking about your dog as an individual is very important. And my dog specifically runs hot. She is just Oh, she's she's warm and she gets overheated very easily being outside so I do try try to feed her more cooling or at least neutral foods um, grass fed beef is considered a neutral food and that's one of her favorite things to eat is grass fed beef so again when we think about feeding the individual pet in front of you a lot of these generalizations don't necessarily apply. But let's get even more into the nitty gritty of it, right? Because chicken specifically is a very inflammatory food because, and in general. Now, if you happen to be buying chicken from local ranches and farms and these chickens are, are great, you know, free roaming and they are fed species appropriate diets, then you may be totally fine with eating your and your dog may and cat may be totally fine with eating that chicken. But in general, the way chickens are raised for even for human consumption, we're not even talking about animal consumption, but even for human consumption, they are very inflammatory foods because they are not fed a species appropriate diet. Most chickens raised for food for slaughter are fed lots of grains and corn and it, it, it makes for them being very very inflamed because they are not those chickens are not being fed a species appropriate diet but then they also generally live in captivity and cages and it all in all makes for a very unhealthy chicken when you eat that unhealthy chicken you then are getting the benefit or the not so much of a benefit <laughs> um, of that animal being very inflammatory and then creating inflammation in your body or your pet's body as well. So I actually really like to steer away from chicken as much as possible. Um, I have two cats that I'm having a really hard time doing that with, but my my cat's finicky eating behaviors are definitely for another episode. Um, I have talked about it a little bit on Patreon, so if you're part of the Patreon family, you, you know the, the issues that I've been having with my cats. But at any rate, again, this is all about feeding the animal in front of you and just because something in general is okay to feed doesn't mean you should be feeding it to your pet. So I started out with some examples of fresh foods that we in general think, oh, that's totally fine. Yeah, I can totally give that to my pet. It's a wonderful fresh food. And yes, it is in moderation and maybe not even to your pet at all, depending on what their health status is because feed the pet in front of you, right? But then we can kind of turn the corner and look at commercially av available pet foods, specifically kibbles and even wet foods that are available for you to buy from the big pet food companies who shall not be named because that's how I feel. That's a Harry Potter reference. Those who shall not be named. But um, a lot of the ingredients that are in these foods, in my opinion, are not fit for consumption to begin with. <laughs> so uh, just to kind of pull from last week's episode, again, if you haven't listened, I highly recommend you go back and listen to that one about the carnivore in your home. But um, there are lots of things in these pet foods that I personally, and I'm not the only one, feel are not appropriate to feed. Um, tapioca, peas, I do not like feeding peas. Um, potatoes, legumes, lentils, chickpeas. 
I don't think these, are the, I know for a fact these are not species appropriate for our dogs or our cats, and I just don't think corn. Corn is a big one, um, any sort of wheat. No, like just no, <laughs> any sort of wheat, any, n none of this. If you happen to see cellulose powder in any food or treat you're buying your pet, that's sawdust, guys. Do you really think that sawdust is appropriate to feed your pet? No, but you probably didn't know what cellulose powder was. That's not your fault. And even if you had read the back of the ingredient package, um, you may not have seen it. So, you know, there's, there's a lot going on there. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff in pet food. Uh, carrageenan, by the way, is in a lot of foods and uh, a lot of wet foods, I know for a fact. It is known to cause GI distress and upset. This is something that should not be in our pet foods. So there's a lot to, to kind of wrap our head arounds that I really want you to start thinking, even if it's okay to feed it, should I be feeding it? So while, okay, it's not going to kill your pet today, tomorrow, maybe even in a year, it's going to potentially significantly harm their health in the long term, such as carrageenan, cellulose powder, um, corn, which is... Ugh, goodness gracious. I, I mean, I could do a whole episode on corn. The, the corn we have today is not anything like ancestral corn or maize, right? It, there, it doesn't look the same. The nutritional value is not the same. I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but I am like darn near 100% sure there isn't a single grain of corn in the world anymore that isn't GMO. I don't know, maybe in some remote village that we haven't reached before and there's some, you know, untouched humans living as nature intended that we don't know anything about. Maybe they still have <laughs> good corn. I don't know. But corn is like, if, if I could pick one fresh food that I would say never, ever, ever any human, dog, cat, no animal on this planet needs to be ingesting, it would be corn. If I could only pick one, it would be corn hands down. No human or animal should be ingesting corn. That, that's my personal opinion. Um, and that even that being said, I freaking love, like, give me some sweet white corn, corn on the cob, oh my goodness, it's delicious. Some good old southern cornbread, oh my, that, I, I'm weak, I'm weak, <laughs> I'm weak, but I know I try my darndest not to eat it. Um, if I do eat it, it's probably once a year at like Christmas or Thanksgiving, and that's it because it's the, it's, in my opinion, the worst thing that we could be eating or feeding to any animal on this planet. But I've kind of gone off in a tangent here. Just because it's quote unquote safe to eat doesn't mean that our pets should be eating it. And by the way, we can include ourselves in that. So really take a long, hard look at any ingredient panel um, of any food you're buying for your dog, for your cat, for your parrot, for your rabbit, for you, it doesn't matter. Any living being um, you are responsible uh, and caring for, take a long, hard look at those ingredient labels before you make a decision to purchase. Or even if you've already made a decision to purchase and it's in your house, it's okay. It, you know, it's okay for you to say, I no longer feel this is good for me or my pets. It's no longer serving us. I'm going to replace it with something better. That's perfectly fine too. Um, and I understand that in the economy we live in now, that may be easier said than done. Totally get that. Um, this is just me providing information because, uh, you know, I do my best to bring you the truth as I know it. So just because something is safe to feed doesn't mean that we should feed it. And remember that we are not feeding our animals, the goal is not to feed our animals to survive, but to thrive, right? We want 
our animals to be around, be as happy and healthy as they can be until the day they are no longer with us. They are no longer alive. That's the goal, um, to, to have a vitally healthy animal. And food is fuel for the body, but it's also medicine for the body. What we put in matters um, very, 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 very much. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and end today's podcast. I hope it wasn't too naggy. I'm not trying to nag. I'm just trying to get express my my feelings <laughs> and get information out there to you and try to flip that switch in your brain so that you start thinking about things a little bit differently because that's the key in life to success no matter what it is we're talking about whether it's raising your kids or being happy yourself or um excelling in your job or career or as an entrepreneur or whatever it may be, your mindset and how you think about things makes all the difference in the world. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm no motivational speaker, I know that, but how you think about things, your outlook, your self-talk, your thought patterns and processes matter so, so much. Um, I mean, yeah, I I don't even, like, I was getting ready to go into a whole thing on depression, but let's not go there. Um, In this episode, just understand that when we change the way we think, we can change our lives and the world, if you so choose to do so. So, With that, I'm going to end the podcast today. I hope you and your pets have a wonderful rest of your night, day, week, weekend, whatever day you happen to be listening to this. Make sure to give them some extra love from me. And as a favor, please share this uh, podcast with friends and family who also have pets. I would be most appreciative, appreciative of you for doing that. Um... Yeah, I'll talk to you next week. Bye, guys. Oh, 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 oh.